In this episode of the Ben Greenfield Fitness Show, which happens to be a recovery super special, how to heal fascia faster, the latest on ibuprofen, do compression tights really work, and much, much more. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition, voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed. Mobility. Balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there. When you look at all the studies done, studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. All the information you need in one place, right here, right now on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Well, Brock, it's been quite a while. Yeah, it has. According to my record, you've been gallivanting the globe. I have been gallivanting the globe. I was in deepest, darkest Peru for the last three weeks. Was that Peru? Was it where the whole time you were in Peru? Yeah. Yeah. I was in, well, I was in Toronto for like four days before we went to Peru. But yeah, the rest of the time, I mean, Peru is so diverse. Like we were in a rainforest jungle down in the Amazon. Then we were in the high Andes. Then we were in the high jungle. Then we were in the Colca Canyon, which is complete desert. It's like, you could basically just go all around Peru and experience everything there is to offer on this planet, pretty much. Like, they've got beaches, they've got mountains, they've got canyons, they've got cactus. Wow. <laughs> they've got it all. Is the Peru Chamber of Commerce paying you? <laughs> I should totally work for their, uh, what are those things called? Not the Chamber of Commerce, the... The Peruvian Tourist Board? There we go, the Tourist yes. Board, yes. I should totally yeah. work for them. Except I don't speak Spanish, so... Were you there doing ayahuasca? I did not do ayahuasca, and it's astounding how many people ask me that when they'd find out we were going to Peru. They're like, oh, are you going to do ayahuasca? I'm like, no, and I also go to New York and don't do heroin. Surprise! Well, everybody and their dog goes to ayahuasca to do Peru, you know. It's very trendy. So I'm disappointed in you that you that you didn't jump in and hook, line, and sinker. Okay, well, in all, um, like full disclosure, I did go to a shaman, and we did do mm. a cleansing ceremony. Um, now, it didn't involve any hallucinogens or anything like that, but... Is that like a uh, colonic or anima, that kind of cleanse? There was no pooping involved either. Mm. There's a lot of shaking of things, chanting of things, smearing some stuff on my head, um, facing particular directions and stuff. It was really cool, but there was no hallucinating or vomiting or, or diarrhea, sadly. Well, I am actually going to do that as a thing. I think my next business, I'm going to market ayahuasca animas and ayahuasca colonics. I'm pretty sure it would be popular. That's a billion dollar idea right there. Everybody wants to shove more things up their butt and shoot more things out their butt. News flashes. So, Brock, uh, this is the part of the show where we talk all about the latest research that I've been tweeting, as I tend to do, over at, at Twitter.com really? slash Ben Greenfield, or on the Weekly Roundup. Do you know that, that every week now I'm sending out all these uh, news flashes on the Weekly Roundup? Yeah, yeah. I'm, surprisingly, I'm on your mailing list. Oh, that surprises me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you go, you go to BenGreenfieldFitness.com, sign up for the newsletter. I'm sending you this. You know what else I'm doing now is I'm sending out... Uh, snippets from the latest books i've read because i'm still reading a book a day i am i am now uh well well into uh almost over 365 books a year now for 10 years wow. so i got a lot of books this practice of of um, breaking copyright law maybe you should try to keep that under your hat a little bit more not tell everybody about it you mean when i post entire snippets and excerpts from books mm -hmm. online mm -hmm. yeah 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 just I, that illegal practice of of distributing publicly other people's copyrighted material. I think it helps out authors, honestly. I I, I agree. I also think torrenting is a is a good thing for the movie industry, but it doesn't negate the fact that it's illegal. Yeah, I guess I'll take it down if some author wants me to, but 
honestly. Yeah. They're, they're little they're little tiny snippets. Uh, anyways, enough. though, so yeah, I'm doing like book snippets. I'm doing like uh, um, you know new things that I'm trying, and then of course the most popular posts that we've done, and then news flashes like this. So um, since we're talking all about recovery today, have you seen the yeah. latest on uh, on ibuprofen <laughs> or NSAIDs? I yeah, for some reason I actually keep my finger pretty close on the pulse of this stuff just because I used a lot of them back in the day. I think you did too. Like when we were racing really hard, I was popping NSAIDs like crazy. I never did because they always made mm-hmm. my stomach hurt, and oh. uh, and it wasn't because I I was aware of the liver and kidney toxicity and all the other issues that have that have come to light about them. I just didn't like the way they made my stomach feel. Uh, but this latest study that came out a couple of weeks ago was testing uh, ibuprofen and non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs on uh, muscle response to training. And yeah. they found a significant attenuation. And uh, for those of you who don't like to use big words, that means basically a significant inhibition of uh, strength <laughs> and muscle building. You swapped a big word for a not quite yeah. as big word. <laughs> Really multisyllabic to that. Means it don't work as good. <laughs> exactly. You don't get as much good out of it. There. Anyways, that? though, uh, what they found was that after resistance training, that anti inflammatory drugs had a really significant uh, impact on an inability to be able to gain strength. And yeah. and part of that may have been the same reason that everything from vitamin C to vitamin E to curcumin may cause the same thing, right? You blunt that hormetic response to exercise and it it may be that that's part of the way that these are acting but i suspect that when you look at things like like liver and kidney toxicity and the impact on things like satellite cells that there's more going on than just a blunting of the hormetic response to exercise and so it's uh uh, apparent in the study that what they said was that there was a down regulated mrna expression of interleukin-6 so There is definitely an impact on the inflammatory response, but ultimately what it comes down to is if you're trying to get swole or you're trying to build strength or you're trying to get hypertrophy, then uh, ibuprofen is not your friend in the same way that if you're exercising in the heat, especially, and you're concerned about liver or kidney toxicity or uh, leaky gut issues or stomach damage, ibuprofen is also not your friend. So there you have it. You know what that proves? What? This actually proves that the old saying, no pain, no gain, is true. It is kind of true, huh? I mean, you, you, you do have to allow soreness to settle in. That, that's one thing true. that I do. You know, we'll, we'll talk about this later on. I think we have a question about anti-inflammatories or, or timing of anti-inflammatories, I believe. Uh, do we? It, I don't know. I, I thought somebody called one in. but <laughs> We'll um, throw one in. Here, <laughs> let me say this. Even for things like curcumin... And I love like high dose curcumin, high dose CBD, some of these potent anti inflammatories. I always time them away from the workout. And my favorite time to take that kind of stuff is right before, and I don't know if you've ever done this, Brock, right before you get deep tissue work. I learned this from the folks down at the human garage. They overdosed me on curcumin one day and uh, also gave me some CBD. And then I had them do their, their really intense, like teeth grittingly hard body work. And my muscles ah. just melted. So. That's a good time to, to take those those anti-inflammatories would be to, and, and I still wouldn't take ibuprofen because of the stomach issues, but if you're going to take some yeah. of these others, uh, right before you do deep tissue work or body work is a really good time. But that's interesting. Is that sort of along the same lines as taking a bunch of niacin before doing a sauna, like just getting all that blood into your into your tissue? Different mechanism of action. So for, for curcumin and for CBD, it's it's actually more of a muscle relaxation response. So plus plus mm. there's there's a little bit of a pain killing response as well. So nice. um, here's another one. Uh, they tested these compression, what they say, compression garments, which makes it sound like one <laughs> giant compression pajama, uh, but more or less compression. I was thinking more like a, a gown, right? A compression gown. Uh, the, these you know like these compression tights. Uh, what they tested was whether or not wearing them during sleep would help you to recover, uh, in this case, from high-intensity exercise and from muscle fatigue. And uh, these are things that, that people will sleep in sometimes. You know, sometimes I'll wear compression tights before a race, uh, after a hard workout, uh, when I really want my wife to be impressed by my sexy underoos, I'll, I'll put on my compression <laughs> tights. Uh, actually, no, you don't want to use compression tights in any type of, of uh, 
sexy romantic situation because they they inhibit your ability to uh, get it up, shall we say? Mm-hmm. Uh, pretty significant. It's the opposite of what Make you it a little bit painful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyways, though, uh, what they found was that when folks wore these compression tights during a night of sleep, uh, it actually did promote what's called localized muscle fatigue recovery meaning the removal of a lot of uh, inflammatory byproducts out of muscle tissue. Now, what it did not do was improve, and and this seemed like a no-brainer to me, but they still cited it in the article, there wasn't a difference in neurological uh, recovery. And what that means is that with, with uh, weight training or any other form of training, you know, musculoskeletal fatigue is pretty easy to figure out. You're sore. The muscles kind of hurt. Uh, you get you know this delayed onset muscle soreness, and that subsides after typically one to two days. And it turns out that that compression uh, tights when you wear them to bed, especially for the legs, can help that to occur even more quickly. But yeah. with neural fatigue, uh, you can exhaust the central nervous system, uh, the local nerves, or what are called the neuromuscular junctions, and then uh, a lot of neurotransmitters and hormones like uh, dopamine and serotonin and epinephrine and cortisol. All of these can tend to get depleted as well, and that's that's the definition of uh, neurological fatigue. And yeah. typically, neurological fatigue uh, takes longer to recover from. Uh, this is why I'm a huge fan of heart rate variability training because heart rate variability training or HRV training or HRV testing allows you to see if you really truly are recovered, even if your muscles aren't sore anymore. And so. It allows you to keep your finger on the pulse of not just what's called musculoskeletal fatigue, but also neuromuscular fatigue or neurological fatigue. So the idea here is that, you know, even if the compression garments help your muscles to feel a little bit better the next day, you should still pay attention to neurological fatigue, too, because it doesn't mean it's affecting your nervous system much at all. And training through neurological fatigue or what's often called in exercise science CNS drain central nervous system mm-hmm. system drain, uh, that's when you tend to see things like overtraining set in or immune system deficits or getting sick or getting injured when athletes feel like they're not sore anymore, but they still push and they're still neurologically fatigued. That's why I'm a fan of you know some of these more advanced methods of, of tracking recovery. Okay, but speaking of advanced methods, what if, let me just put this to you, what if you took a pair of compression socks, mm. you tied them really tightly mm. around your head? Mm. Would that help? Yeah. You mean for, for like your brain? Mm-hmm. I'm pretty yeah. sure. Yeah. You go first. Okay. All right. I do I, that out. I do have a really tight toque I could, mm-hmm. I could use too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Jack up that compression <laughs> toque. <laughs> compression toque. Oh, there's a billion dollar idea too. We're full of them today. Yeah, it's right up there with my ayahuasca enemas. Absolutely. Uh, this, this is kind of sort of related to recovery. Uh, but it's the these brand new color changing tattoos that monitor oh, your so blood cool. glucose. Did you see this? Yeah. So, so basically, what what they're doing now is they're using what are called biosensitive inks uh, designed at places like Harvard and MIT, and they interact with the body's interstitial fluid. Now, that, that's the fluid that transfers nutrients into cells and carries waste out of cells. And uh, this fluid can act as an indicator of the chemical concentrations in the blood of things like blood glucose. So there's this uh, there's this new blood glucose tattoo that they're using that will change from green to brown when your blood glucose goes up. There's another one they have that will track your sodium concentration and prevent you from getting theoretically dehydrated by turning uh, brighter green when you have more sodium in your bloodstream, which would indicate uh, dehydration, you know, and, and uh, a drop in water and increase in, in solutes in the blood. But it's really interesting. The, these tattoos will actually indicate something like blood glucose. And I think this is cool because, uh, you know, they they do have things like these continuous blood glucose monitors. And obviously, it's not that hard to go to Walgreens and get like a little AccuCheck blood glucose meter to, to test your blood glucose at yeah. any given point. But uh, I talked about this when I spoke recently at the Wesson A. Price Conference a, a, f- a few days ago, actually, over in Minneapolis. This idea that uh, glycemic variability, it's called glycemic variability, those are just daily swings in your blood glucose levels. That tends to be extremely highly correlated to obesity, to overweight, to, to chronic disease, and even to longevity, meaning how many what are called intraday 
glycemic excursions that you experience, now, whether that be hyperglycemia from starches and sugars, whether it be hypoglycemia from you know the, the insulin rebound type of effect that might occur from those foods. Basically, this, this concept of glycemic variability and management of glycemic variability via everything from you know, um, uh, constantly moving after meals to using some of the things we've talked about before on this show before, like Ceylon cinnamon and apple cider vinegar to, uh, to engaging in uh, what's known as the first phase insulin response, meaning that you chew your food really well, or you use bitters before a meal to enhance Mm -hmm. your blood glucose response to a meal. Basically all of those strategies are extremely important, not just for lowering your risk of, of diabetes, but for longevity and overall reduction of, of uh, chronic disease risk, and these tattoos might be a really good way to see if you're if you're doing that well. Plus, they're sexy as hell. So you're saying that the blood sugar roller coaster is not a fun ride that you want to be on? Probably not. No, yeah. not a fun ride at all. You know, the only problem with these tattoos is I'm afraid if I had one, I'd like eat a whole bunch of donuts just to change the color of the tattoo to match my outfit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You you could yeah. you could biohack your tattoos. To match your fashion. Yeah, it's like, oh, this doesn't match my my pants, so yeah. gotta pound some pound some sugar. Exactly, just like a chameleon. Constantly exactly. colors. A diabetic chameleon. Hey, here's one more. Uh this this idea. Oh, I did want to mention one other thing when it comes to this glycemic variability. Do it. Uh I I just helped Wellness FX, uh this this blood testing platform come out with a new anti-aging test. And we included uh glucose on that test. But then we also included another highly related uh, corollary, IGF-1. And so what this test tests for, and I just went to the lab and did it myself, you test all of these different biomarkers that have been associated with aging. And they are uh, red blood cell magnesium. You can write these down or, or go to the show notes if you want to know what to test if you wanted to see if you were going, doing a good job with your anti-aging protocol. So red blood cell magnesium. Uh, estradiol, high sensitive C reactive protein, also known as HSCRP, marker of inflammation, a full lipid panel, testosterone and free testosterone, IGF 1, insulin, omega 3 fatty acids, and a complete blood count. Like, like if you could test anything other than just your telomere length, those would be the biggies. And so I approached Wellness FX a few weeks ago and I said, hey, look, why don't you guys just have a panel that will only test these biomarkers associated with aging? And uh, lo and behold, they designed the panel. So it's called, hmm. the, it's called the Greenfield Anti-Aging Panel. I can put a link to it in the show notes. So, And it's only four ninety nine right now. It's actually even less than that. It's like 300 bucks. So, yeah. Oh, I meant, I meant $4.99, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, yeah. No, it's a little more than four ninety nine. Yeah, as I expected, those are not inexpensive tests if you get them all separately. That's for sure. So actually, under three hundred bucks is pretty amazing. Yeah. So bundled, you actually, you, it's a, it's a pretty good deal. So everybody loves a bundle. One other study I wanted to mention was that uh, you know a lot of people will say that our ancestors never took supplements, so we shouldn't take supplements. Yeah, idiots say that. Yeah, idiots. <laughs> Uh, anyways, they uh, they had this uh, uh, story that came out in Discover Magazine about how Neanderthals, that is, it's entitled Ailing Neanderthals, used penicillin and aspirin. Uh, and what they found, this international team uh, from University of Adelaide in Australia, they analyzed DNA from these different Neanderthals and specifically analyzed DNA from their teeth. And they found found that these Neanderthals were surviving on uh, interesting things like woolly rhinoceros and wild sheep and wild mushroom and pine nuts and moss and mushrooms and tea bark. But then they also found uh, that one of them uh, who they somehow determined was was a sick Neanderthal. I'm not sure how you do that with Mm. DNA analysis, but they have a way of looking at the bacteria and seeing if they're sick or not. They found that this dude was uh, eating a steady diet of poplar. Uh, which is a, a, a tree that has the natural painkiller salicylic acid in it. Uh, and that's the active ingredient in aspirin, of course. Acetosalic silic acid? No. Salicylic acid, yeah. Isn't this it guy was also. It might be acetosalicylic anyway, acid, but yeah, that's a, that's a rabbit hole. We're getting hung up on yeah, it. Never mind. I don't want to get in an argument about that. Uh, the other thing was that uh, he was eating uh, these plants that were covered in penicillin mold. 
uh, which generate the antibiotic, penicillin. So uh, what they're hypothesizing is that he was suffering from a dental abscess. And uh, because he was suffering from that, he knew to dose with uh, penicillin mold and salicylic acid. And everything from essential oils to things that, that folks would prepare in mortar and pestle, you know, wild nettle and nettle seed and, and all manner of different ancient medicines were really just the equivalent, in my opinion, of modern supplementation. And what I find even more fascinating is we see animals doing this, too. Have you seen about these animals that self-medicate? Yeah. Yeah, the, the dolphins that get high and... <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, not not just psychotropic, you know, not, not, not just uh, party animals, but... <laughs> Literal party animals. For example, like, baboons eat the leaves of this specific plant that combats uh, flatworms when they get flatworms. Or uh, one of the other things that you'll see is uh, there's, there's, like... Uh, lemurs in madagascar that they've studied that will nibble on things that increase milk production like uh, tamarind leaves and fig leaves yeah. uh they've got pregnant elephants in kenya have those leaves of this this tree that they will eat to induce delivery and to cause uterine contractions and and of course there's, there's a whole bunch of different animals that self-medicate like bears and deer and elk and different carnivores uh, a lot of them for for parasites by the way they actually animals somehow intuitively know which leaves and which plants will help to get rid of parasites. That's a big one you see ants self-medicating with. But there's there's a lot of, of, of interesting studies on self-medication in animals. And it goes above and beyond just like, I, th I think, what do they talk about that in, in the book Stealing Fire, I think? Yeah. About yeah. how animals get high. Yeah. yeah. So, so animals don't just get high, but they also uh, will self-medicate. So I think it's fascinating, this, this idea that, you know, ancient man and also modern animals – tap into nature as a form of self-medication. Yeah, it's, it's not encapsulation. It's not tablets or pills or powders, but it, it's very interesting. And, and that's that's my response to people. You know, when people say, oh, you don't need supplements. Nobody nobody used to take supplements. Well, they, they kind of did. We just have a more convenient mechanism of delivery now, in my yeah. opinion. In your face, Alexander Fleming. In your face. Special Announcements. Hey, before we jump into our sponsors for today's show, Brock, uh, mm -hmm. did you know that there's a there's a new sponsorship opportunity for people out there who want to go climb uh, Mount Kilimanjaro? Did you see this? Ooh, I did. I'm excited. Yeah. I tweeted about it. I'm probably going to go. So uh, Wim Hof and me and a group of, of other folks, possibly you if you're listening in, we're going to go uh, climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Which is, not, I mean, yeah, people die climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, but it's because they're they're stupid. Uh, Wim's done this <laughs> three times. I mean, they're stupid or unlucky or, yeah, anyways. Or pig-headed. I think most people die on those kind of yeah. trips because they're... I don't want to sound insensitive, but I think the reason that a lot of people die, from what I understand, it's altitude sickness and lack of proper preparation. So... Yeah. Yeah. Well, and altitude sickness is, they say that altitude affects you when your attitude is wrong and it's like mm. when you push through it instead of being smart and being like you know what i just need a few yeah. days to adjust yeah so, you need the right altitude attitude anyways though wim I, hof uh me and a, a group of lucky folks again possibly you if you're listening in we're gonna go climb mount kilimanjaro in our shorts so there you have it with no oxygen what else would you wear <laughs> Exactly. Shorts and no oxygen. It's not that hard, but I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge. And we're going to be followed by documentary filmmakers. Um, I believe Dominique D'Agostino might be going to uh, to test people, you know, with regards to like ketosis and oxygen deficits. Uh, rumor has it a couple of celebs might be joining in like uh, Jim Carrey and Chris Hemsworth. And so, but, uh, that's crazy. Yeah. I you know can go, go climb Mount Kilimanjaro with Thor and the mm. Grinch. <laughs> The Grinch. That's what he wants to be known for. <laughs> so it's five thousand bucks to to get in on this. I think they're looking for like some corporate sponsors too. But the website is tippingpointsummit.org. Tippingpointsummit.org. Um, I'll put a link to that in the show notes too. If you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash three seventy five and you want to get in on the the Kilimanjaro climb, then uh, go check it out. Tippingpointsummit.org. What did you say? Five thousand dollars. 
it's five thousand dollars to like register and 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 actually go on the climb. But then I think they're they're also looking for sponsors, like you know, title sponsors and stuff like that, mm. to promote on the documentary and to promote through all the media that's happening for the event. Cool. And they're also raising money for charity. It's uh, raising money for the St. Jude's Children's Hospital. So, all right, there you have it. Uh, so check that out. And then uh, this podcast is brought to you by. A few really cool things. Um, the first is something that I literally just had my ears this morning when I was drinking my smoothie. Uh, and my smoothie this morning, by the way, for any of you who are curious, was bone broth with ice, a little bit of, I uh, used a vanilla whey protein powder to get a little bit of extra glutathione because I've been traveling. And then I, I blended all that up and I put a little vitamin C in from some lemon juice to enhance the collagen absorption from the bone broth. And then uh, put in some coconut flakes, a little bit of spirulina, and a few cacao nibs, and suck that bad boy down. Mm. So that was my uh, that was my brekkie. What'd you have for breakfast? I actually had a big mush of stuff like that too. I had some collagen protein mixed with some uh, yogurt, with some coconut flakes, chia seeds, uh, flax ground up flax seeds, and what else did I throw in there? Oh, and some avocado. Mm. Amazing. Mm. Sounds delicious. So it's just a big pile of mush. And I actually thought about while I was eating it, I was like, oh man, Katie Bowman would be so disappointed in me because it wasn't chewy. I wasn't working my mandibles. Yeah. Speaking of that first phase insulin response, that's why I always save all the chewy stuff for the very end after I'm done blending. Then I put it in. Then you chew on your smoothie. Yeah. yeah. And if anybody doesn't know what we're talking about. What, what do they say? Chew your liquids, swallow your solids, something like that. Who says that? I think I totally messed that up. <laughs> Nobody says that. That's crazy talk. No, it's it's drink your solids, chew your liquids. I'm pretty sure that's the phrase. Yeah. How? No, seriously. Look it up. Pretty I sure. Will. That's like because that sounds like crazy talk. So the whole time I was I was drinking my smoothie, I was wearing my human charger. Cause like I mentioned, I've been traveling uh back east. So I wait until the time when I actually want to wake up in the morning and then I blast my ears with a very bright white light to target the photoreceptors in my ears that send my brain the message that it is it is morning, wherever I happen to be in the world. So it, it's very cool. It targets these photosensitive proteins on the surface of the brain, very similar to those that you find in the retina of the eye, and it increases things like serotonin and dopamine and noradrenaline and, of course, uh, reboots your circadian rhythm. It's called a human charger. So everybody listening in, uh, you get a 20% discount on it. You go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash human charger, and the code that you enter is BEN20. BEN20. And if you That's a new code. Yeah, it's a new code. If you have trouble remembering these codes, just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 375, and I'll put all of the codes in there for the human charger, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, speaking of sleep, uh, this podcast is also brought to you by... One of the bounciest, most comfortable, most cradling mattresses on the face of the planet. Uh, Ooh, perfectly cradling. perfectly designed for humans. Yeah, cradles your natural geometry. I mean, you spend a third of your life sleeping, mm. right? So you want to be comfortable. Uh, so this mattress is called the Casper. You may have heard of it before. I've got one up in my guest room, and it actually is really comfortable, and you actually do stay really cool during a night of sleep because I sometimes go into my guest room and sleep when my... Wife and I have huge arguments. I'm in the doghouse, just going to the guest room. Oh, no, I actually, dude. No, but some, sometimes we do. Our, we're on different sleep cycles, or I'm getting up early to go to the airport and I don't wake her up. So I just go in the bedroom to sleep. It's a really nice mattress. I see no problem with yeah. that. You know, Absolutely. it doesn't mean you don't love your your partner just right. because you don't sleep with them all right. the time. Exactly. So <laughs> there you go. That's my PSA for today. <laughs> exactly. You got lots of good PSAs for <laughs> Peru and mattresses. I'm full of them. Uh, they've got three metals. They got the original Casper, and they have these new ones called the Wave, and another one called the Essential. And they've got a whole bunch of other things to to ensure you get an overall better sleep experience. And you can check all of that out, including their mattresses that have the supportive memory foam with the right sleep surface for the best sink and the best bounce. Um, if you go to the following. Uh, casper.com slash Ben and you use promo code Ben at checkout casper.com slash Ben and use promo code Ben at checkout and that will get you 50 bucks towards any mattress purchase so 50 bucks nice you're welcome 
Uh, this podcast is also brought to you by eHarmony. You ever used eHarmony, Brock? No, they invented the internet mm. after I was long in a relationship. Mm. So, yeah, sadly. me too. I've been married for 14 years. I never got a chance to use any of these dating websites except yeah. amihotornot.com. Remember that one? <laughs> I do remember that one. Yeah. That was yeah. not a good idea. <laughs> well, eHarmony is a lot more advanced than that. So yes. it, it, yeah. it's it's uh, not similar to a lot of these other online dating websites because they are more looking at, at helping you to find a lasting and meaningful relationship and not a, not a shallow hookup. So... I like uh, websites that do exist that might rhyme with What's, Winder or Fender or Bender. Uh, and eHarmony is helping. Isn't it Binder or Tinder? Bind, no, we're not allowed to say that. They might get mad at us. Plus, we'd never get our podcast sponsored by Tinder. I'm just saying. Anyways, just though. Just saying, just in case. eHarmony, super easy to set up an account. They've helped over a million people find the perfect match. Uh, they use science and data and even psychological research to send you the right matches. And yeah, there's a lot of hookup sites, like I mentioned, out there, but that's not what eHarmony is for. It's actually for people who want to like form a lasting, meaningful relationship and not a one-night stand. So uh, it's it's you know one of those things I can actually get behind because, frankly, I'm not really not into these websites that are just like hookup websites. But I do like this idea of using science to find someone who's super compatible with you. So I think it's a cool idea. And um, you can get a free month of eHarmony uh, with any of their three-month subscriptions. You just go to eHarmony.com, just like it sounds, and you enter the code GREEN at checkout. And that gets you a, a free month with every three-month subscription. So there you have it. And I would go there and do it myself, but my wife might raise an eyebrow. So mm-hmm. I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, leave that to you singles who are listening to the show. E-Harmony. Uh, and then finally, this podcast is brought to you by TradeStation. You know what TradeStation is, Brock? I have absolutely no idea. All right. So this is cool. Uh, basically, uh, TradeStation is an online trading platform uh, to help people trade online uh, and get involved in the stock market. But they have this new program for all active military veterans and first responders. They can trade commission-free. It's actually a pretty big deal because a lot of these these websites, they charge huge commissions. Uh, Commission-free, free free real-time market data, no software fees, so they're basically dedicated to helping out everyone who has invested in our country uh, to invest. So uh, it's really cool. It's called Trade Station Salutes. And uh, what they're dedicated to doing is helping active duty military and veterans and first responders uh, learn how to get involved with trading and enjoy commission-free trading to help them out along the way. So it's very cool. I like what they're doing. Uh, and they help you develop strategies to invest, whether you're trading stocks or options or futures or anything at all. So uh, they're uh, basically getting any of our listeners uh, into TradeStation. If you just go to TradeStation.com, just like it sounds, TradeStation.com slash Greenfield. TradeStation.com slash Greenfield. So there you have it. Brock, uh, as, a, as a Canadian podcaster, are you an active military veteran or first responder? Afraid not. No, I'm, so, so I, you I don't can't think I qualify. Use, you can't use eHarmony or TradeStation, but you can get a human charger and you can uh, I have sleep one. on a Casper. You know what's yeah. ironic is my, my human charger currently needs to be charged. Otherwise, mm. I would have used it this morning. Yeah. All right. A few quick things for those of you listening in. I'm headed to San Francisco this weekend, the weekend that you're listening to this podcast episode to race the San Francisco Spartan race on Saturday. Be sure to come by and say hi, especially if you're racing. I'll be there along with my twin boys. Uh, And then November 28th and 29th, I'll be in New York City. Uh, The evening of the 28th, I'll be speaking at the Alchemist Kitchen in New York City. And the evening of the 29th, I'll be speaking with Dr. uh, or or, uh, or Chef. Not doctor, he's a chef. I get the two mixed up because they both wear white coats. Uh, Chef David Boulet, amazing, like a French-Japanese fusion cuisine chef. So I'll be speaking uh, in November uh, then and uh, traveling all over the world at some other events. The XPT Experience in Kauai, Hawaii, December 7th through the 12th. I'll be in Hawaii. And then December 11th through the 23rd, I'll be uh, speaking at at a yoga retreat down in Panama. And then finally, I'll arrive home in time for Christmas, 
and my birthday. So mm-hmm. there you have it. I'll put a link to all that stuff over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 375 in addition to all the other upcoming events. Listener Q&A. Uh, hi Ben, my question is: What would you re- what would you uh, recommend for uh, injury of fascia? Or fascia, I don't know. Uh, would you recommend peptides or something like uh, MK six seven seven? Thank you. You know how I like to think of fascia, Brock. <laughs> how? Like a giant stocking of your whole body. Mm. Big stocking. And it actually is kind of like that. A gooey, sticky stocking. A gooey, sticky stocking. I used to dissect cadavers when I was at University of Idaho. I I was the guy in charge of dissecting the cadavers that would come into the anatomy and physiology lab. And fascia is very, very interesting stuff. So um, basically, uh, fascia will surround the muscles, but then dive deep into all of the musculature. It it almost looks like like a... honeycomb from the inside out or, or the way that i like to think of it is if you have you ever looked at like a uh, wedge of an orange and all the individually little wrapped pods that open up when yeah. you open an orange yeah, the right way yeah, yeah. so so fascia is a little bit like that it, it connects muscle to bone so tendons are actually considered to be a part of the fascial system and then bone to bone ligaments are also part of the fascial system and it has slings like around all the different organ structures inside your gut uh, it cushions your vertebrae, so technically discs are considered to be part of the fascial system. It wraps around the bones, hmm. which a lot of people don't realize. So fascia is very interesting, and and it is it's so prevalent around the human body, and that that's one of the reasons it's been overlooked for a really long time. Uh, you know, it was thought for a long time it was just like these little packing peanuts in between all of your soft tissue, <laughs> and and it, it's really a lot more advanced than that i mean if you listen to my interview with the human garage we talk about how a lot of communication uh within the body uh, in in between the, the joints and the muscles in the brain occurs via the fascia so to understand how you can get fascia to recover more quickly you have to understand a few things about fascia first of all it's what's called a tensional fluid system and what that means is that I think we did talk about this with, with Katie Bowman, is that, that fascia that's juicy, that's well hydrated, that you know, you think of your fascia like a sponge, right? When your sponge dries mm-hmm. out, it's very brittle and hard and gets kind of crispy, but then when the sponge is wet and well hydrated, it's springy and it's resilient. And you can like, you know, curl it into a little ball and it'll bounce back and you can wring it and you can twist it, but it's hard to break. And fascia is is very similar. And so one of the things that's that's super important is to keep fascia well hydrated. And it comes down to more than just drinking water. Uh, because when when we're talking about fascia and the way that it can become brittle or the way that you can you can get a greater risk for erosion or tear or rupture, you know, drinking water is one thing, but it actually has to actually reach the tissue. It has to reach the fascia. So to be able to get the tissue. Uh, hydrated, uh, or, or what we would call irrigated, because there are actually these little micro vacuoles that feed into all of your fascia, you have to combine adequate hydration with adequate amount of myofascial work. You know, that that's why every single morning, you know, when I get up, especially the older I get, I make love to everything from the, you know, the, the double peanut lacrosse ball thing to the foam roller to the you know, to that evil thing from uh, from Rogue Fitness called the Battle Star, to uh, to like vibrating tools like the Hypersphere or the um, the Viper, which are like vibrating foam rollers. I have all these different methods, but so I I get up in the morning and I have two enormous glasses of water, chock full of minerals, and then uh, one of the very first things I do while well, the coffee or the tea is on is I work on my fascia. So remember, it's not just about drinking water, but it's about working the fascia so that you're untangling a lot of the gluey bits and getting hydration into the actual fascia. So that's one thing to think about is is hydration. Um, movement can also help out quite a bit with, with getting uh, hydration into the fascia. And that's why I'm a, I'm a huge fan of active recovery as well. And, you know, moving in a lot of of different positions and at different angles. So 
Um, that can help out quite a bit. So I, I know some of this stuff is pretty intuitive, but these mm -hmm. are the things that a lot of people don't think about. Um, another thing that can help to, to add a little bit of juiciness to the fascia is uh, springiness. So when your tissue is able to retain its natural spring, the rebounding effect of the fascia helps you, again, to, to get more hydration into the fascia. So doing things that involve uh, bouncy movements, and that could be like the the Tai Chi or the, or the Qi Gong type of shaking protocol a lot of people do in the morning. Like I learned this one from Commander Mark Divine, where you just stand and you kind of shake your whole body for about five mm -hmm. minutes every morning. Uh, jumping on a mini trampoline, jumping rope, uh, box jumps, uh, kettlebells are technically a, a really good form. Like a kettlebell swing is a perfect form of kind of like a, a springing type of action that's, that's very nourishing for the elastic qualities of the fascia. So that would be, you know, a good way to start the morning would be you get up, you hydrate, you do the deep tissue work, and then you do something springy, right? Like shaking or like mini trampoline or kettlebell swings or anything that, that basically increases uh, the health of the fascia from a springiness standpoint. Um, the other thing to understand is that fascia is a very rich sensory organ. Uh, it's one of the richest sensory organs. It has about six to ten times the higher quantity of nerve receptors than your muscles have. And because it's so reliant upon proprioception, not only do you want to keep it hydrated and not only do you want to keep it springy, but you want to improve proprioception by uh, engaging in balancing type of motions so that you're, you're constantly kind of like keeping the fascia awake, so to speak. So this would be like single leg balance drills, uh, single leg squats, you know, single arm type of drills. A lot of yoga moves rely upon uh, quite a bit of, uh, of balance. One of my favorite ways, and this is actually what, what I did this morning for my workout, was these core foundation routines by this guy named uh, Dr. Eric Goodman. And uh, he's got these different uh, routines where you elongate and you stretch and you do what's called decompression, but it's like self-decompression. And that's a great way to introduce more hydration into a joint. So, for example, you would stand... Uh, this is what I was doing this morning. You stand with your feet wide and you kind of drive your heels into the ground and then you push your butt out away behind you and you reach really, really long with your hands out in front of you and you just take anywhere from five to 10 deep breaths in that position, decompressing mm -hmm. the spine as you breathe. So that that's a perfect example of something you could do to work on both balance as well as like this decompressive or or tractioning effect that again introduces more hydration into a joint. So those would be those would be a few of the things that come to mind for for the fascia that are just like simple things you can do that don't involve like injecting peptides or anything like that but are, that are just, you know, basic day-to-day -day habits that will help the fascia stay supple and stay hydrated and keep adhesions from forming of course because you're doing the deep tissue work as well. Mm -hmm. Um, stretching is, in, in my opinion, stretching is, is not as important as some of these, these other, uh, recommendations that I've given just because, you know, the, the fascia can withstand up to 2000 pounds of pressure per square inch. So Damn. if it's tight, yeah, if it's tight, you're not going to be able to just like stretch your way into healthy fascia. I'm a, I'm a bigger fan of you know, a lot of the bouncy, springy type of motions where you, you're taking advantage of, of momentum uh, along with hydration and some of these deep tissue work. Uh, Kelly Starrett's book, Becoming a Supple Leopard, goes into this idea of holding areas of tension with sustained pressure, sometimes for three to five minutes. That's how long it takes. So understand that, you know, even though you see in a lot of these instructional videos, you know, people will foam roll over an area like 10 times and then just you know, move on to the next area. Sometimes you need to find a spot where there's tension in fascia, pin it and work that for, for a good three to five minutes. So I would check out uh, Kelly Starrett's book, Becoming a Supple Leopard too. And that that's actually, I mean, th th this, is, this is just like a perfect kind of uh, speak of the devil type of thing is that when I woke up this morning, my psoas and my, my iliacus were a little tight. So I, I have Kelly's book, uh, hi Kelly, by the way, I think Kelly's going to come. Hi Kelly, that, that San Francisco Spartan as well. Um, oh, cool. so I have Kelly's book out in the same kind of bin that I keep all my deep tissue work in. And I just flipped open. It's like a cookbook, right? For your fascia. So I flipped open to the iliac psoas section and he had a really good one in there where you take a lacrosse ball and you lay on your back with your legs up on a couch and you pin that lacrosse ball into your psoas with a kettlebell. 
And then while holding the kettlebell against the lacrosse ball on your hips, you kind of move your leg in circles and up and down and back and forth. It's called flossing the psoas, right? So I flossed my psoas on the right side and I flossed my psoas on the left side and I kind of worked my way up to the iliacus. And then after that, I stood up and I went through Dr. Eric Goodman's core foundation routine. So like this morning was a perfect example of me caring for my fascia. And of course, like I mentioned before I did that, I had two big glasses of water with minerals. So you know, it's a lot of those simple things. I, the, those are the things I recommend before you go out and freaking like, you know, buy peptides or BPC-157 or TB-500 or any of these kind of like, you know, uh, molecules that are supposed to help to, to heal muscles faster. I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm a bigger fan of starting with the simple things uh, for both taking care of your fascia as well as recovering from a fascial injury. Now, that being said, I will give you two perfect examples of how you could use something like peptides, uh, and other techniques. So, um, I have, uh, a little bit of a hamstring issue going on right now. Um, geez, you're falling and, apart, man. Well, I'm always, I'm always doing things to my body. <laughs> I'm, I live life to the fullest Brock. Uh, anyways though. So right now, while you and I are talking, I'm using what's called P E M F. And I'll talk about this a little bit later on in the show when I talk about recovery, but more or less, PMF improve it increases circulation to uh, to muscle tissue, but it also activates uh, mitochondria. This this specific uh, process called myosin phosphorylation. That's the process of energy production in your muscle, and phosphorylation produces ATP. Uh, when in, when a muscle or fascial area is depleted of ATP, it becomes a little bit weak and a little bit unresponsive. Uh, and when PMF does that, it also increases blood flow to an area. So it can accelerate tissue healing pretty dramatically. And because I have this little hamstring issue going on, uh, and this was just from, from doing box jumps and maybe going a little bit too heavy on the kettlebell swings, I did, when I woke up this morning, a little injection of what's called BPC-157. Very simple to order online, and, and it, I just did a, a subcutaneous injection of that into the upper right hamstring. So I laid down on the floor while my kids were getting ready for school, and the dog was running around me, and I shoved a needle up into my butt and I did my BPC-157. And now while you and I are talking, literally, right now, I have, I'm wearing compression shorts, but tucked into those compression shorts, I've got this little device called a flex bolt, which is a PEMF device, and I have it set at a frequency that actually heals muscle more quickly. It's a 100 hertz frequency. Uh, underneath that that frequency, I have magnesium lotion. So the frequency from the flex pulse is kind of driving the magnesium lotion a little bit deeper into the tissue. Uh, but that that's a perfect example of, of kind of like a little bit more of a biohacking approach to something like a fascial in injury. But I don't want to underemphasize the fact that you should go with a lot of those basics before you start to do things like PMF and injections and magnesium lotions and you know things along those lines. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I actually would consider the magnesium lotion to be one of the more basic ones, but, um, but definitely, yeah, that's, that's good stuff. And actually a lot of surprises in there. I didn't think you were going to go where you went. That's awesome. Yeah, there you go. And, and by the way, the PMF is good. Uh, another, another thing you could use to drive, uh, something like a topical, right? Like whether it's a topical CBD or topical magnesium or topical anti-inflammatory in the muscle, uh, would be electrical muscle stimulation. Uh, be sure that if you do that, uh, don't use one of these TENS units, which just deadens nerves and, and covers up pain. And be careful even with some of the stronger units. You know, they, they have their time and place for strength and power and things like that. But um, I use the uh, the Mark Pro for injuries. It's a it's a electrical muscle stimulation device called the Mark Pro because it uses what's called a dynamic decaying waveform. And all that means is it grabs some of your slow twitch muscle before it recruits any fast twitch muscle. It's a little bit more of a, a therapeutic way to heal muscle. So if you weren't going to do PMF and you were going to do what's called electrical muscle stimulation, you'd use this dynamic decaying waveform. Uh, but ultimately, uh, th those are some of my biggies. Uh, hydrate, do some, do some bounciness, swinging, springy type of stuff. Do your deep tissue work. Um, do your tractioning or your decompression type of work. Uh, and then look into some of these things like, you know, injectable BPC-157 or, or the other close cousin of that called TB-500, which are just healing peptides that act, they act kind of similarly to stem cells, except you can inject them yourself. 
look into like a pulsed electromagnetic field therapy or electrical muscle stimulation or both if an area is injured. And then if you want to kind of drive a topical deeper into the tissue, put a topical like magnesium lotion on before you use something like that. And, and uh, those would be some of the biggies that come to mind. Okay, so our next question, and this is because we actually called out on Facebook for um, specific questions about recovery. So not all of our questions, not like normal, not all of our questions are actually um, audio questions. I actually have to do some, some reading now. Think I can handle it? Are the words very large with colorful pictures? Because if so, probably. If not, highly doubtful. <laughs> she totally wrote a, a pop-up book for me, so no problem. All right, you got this, Brock. Okay, okay. Uh, Jen says, how far down into the red do you allow yourself to go with HRV? As a cyclist, I follow my coach's periodization training program weekly, monthly, seasonally. She races a bunch of crits, mostly on weekends. So often I will find a hard week of workouts where I don't fully recover, but then it'll be followed by a lighter week where I may be recovered for the entire week. I don't like to see um, falling into, or I don't like to see that I'm only 21 or 25% recovered, and I worry that I'm doing some damage. I don't get sick, but I do feel extreme fatigue sometimes, which requires extra recovery methods. I guess I always wonder if this is making me a better athlete or just increasing the need to recover, if you know what I mean. You sounded just like a gen. Yeah. If I closed my ass, could have swore. I, I put on a wig. That was the difference. <laughs> Here's what a lot of people misunderstand when it comes to doing something like tracking your heart rate variability or wanting to feel recovered all the time. The fact is that a high heart rate variability is not always a good thing. Uh, and if you're looking for greater training adaptations when it comes to tracking something like HRV, which, which I do believe is one of the best ways to track your readiness to train or your recovery. And, you know, I, I use multiple methods for that. I wear a ring that spits out a readiness score for me every morning, this, this ring called the Aura Ring. And then I also use the app called the Nature Beat app uh, to see whether it's sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system fatigue that might be causing a, a lower HRV so I can kind of train intelligently that day, you know, if my my sympathetic nervous system is beat up, I might still be able to go out and handle a swim or a bike ride or a run. And if my parasympathetic nervous system is beat up, vice versa. And if both are beat up, then that might be a, you know, Game of Thrones day or, mm -hmm. you know, hang out with the kids playing Legos day. Wait, what do you mean by Game of Thrones day? That sounds ominous. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I've run around naked in the backyard with my, with my broadsword. <laughs> uh, Anyways, though, so the idea, though, is that if the HRV is low, sometimes there might be a reason that it's low, whether you're working with a coach or whether you're training yourself. Uh, and the reason for that is because training with a high intensity or high volume when your HRV has dropped low can basically put you into a state of slight overreaching. And in many cases, that is a good thing if you're able to bounce back for that. It's called overload training. And one of the most common responses to overload training is a progressive decrease in HRV. It's the typical alarm response to a stressor. Usually, it's the sympathetic arm of the autonomic nervous system that's going to get activated in response to that chronic stress. Your resting heart rate goes up and your HRV goes down. And that's why, you know, a very intense day of training could result in a suppressed HRV, like I mentioned earlier, due to neurological fatigue for a good three or four days after a hard workout. That's why you can't just listen to muscle soreness and why you need to track something like your nervous system recovery. Uh, but you can actually stay in that state for a while. For example, there was one study that they did on decreased HRV in response to overload training, right? Like training when your HRV is still low. And this was in runners. And uh, they spent a good three weeks in an overload period of low HRV with continual training. And then on the fourth week, what they did was they reduced the training load and they did what's called a taper. The HRV went up and not only did it go up, but it exceeded the original baseline values and the athletes saw a significant rise in aerobic fitness by overloading 
and then and then detraining the body or allowing for a little bit of a taper. And there's a there's a physiological reason for for this idea, and it really is a process of what's called periodization, where you train hard. You have certain times of the year or times of the week where you overtrain or what would be more appropriately called overreach, and then you supercompensate, meaning that you you allow yourself to get adequate recovery uh, to recover from a workload your body was previously not suited to withstand. And that allows you to see almost like a stair-stepping increase in your fitness. Now, when you overreach or when you let your HRV go low and you continue to train through that, again, for up to three weeks, you, you can do this as long as you're being careful that you're not overtraining and you're simply overreaching. And that's where, yeah. you know, working with a coach or a personal trainer to make sure that, that, you're, that, you're, that you're not crossing over into the realm of overtraining. That's a tricky fine line. It is. It's a tricky fine line. That's where you need to work with a professional. Mm -hmm. uh, like I us. I say so myself. Waka waka. When, when you taper, uh, some of the things that happen, once you've actually dug yourself deep in that hole, you get a big increase in mitochondrial density and what's called mitochondrial proliferation, big increase in capillarization or blood flow to a muscle area, big increase in enzymatic activity related uh, especially to aerobic fitness, which is... Which is uh, related to, again, mitochondrial density, capillarization, uh, oxygen delivery to muscle tissue, et cetera. All of these take place when you give yourself permission to sometimes train through fatigue or sometimes train with a high HRV. Now, I'm often asked, you know, well, you know, as I just alluded to, you know, how, how hard is too hard? You know, how do you know that you're not getting into like uh, overtraining territory? Mm -hmm. And in a case like that, typically what we see with overtraining as opposed to overreaching is a very significant drop in libido, a very significant uh, drop in the testosterone to cortisol ratios if you were doing blood testing, a significant increase in muscle soreness accompanied with things like a loss of weight, uh, decreased what's called a profile of mood state score. Um, a lot of variables that that go above and beyond just kind of kind of feeling tired and stiff, and instead uh, feel more like you're getting sick. Like I, I know that that's kind of more of a qualitative approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we were looking at this with uh, heart rate variability, for example, some of the things that I look for, like in a healthy, robust athlete, if I see both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system values dropping from like the thousands into the hundreds, that would be one example. Or if I see a very significant drop in weight, or if I see a resting heart rate go up at rest by more than about five beats, those are all signs that you're kind of delving into that overtraining versus the overreaching category, at which point you really would want to rest and nip things in the bud. But supercompensation is, is definitely a reason to train, even sometimes when you are fatigued, and to not worry that much if, uh, if you have fatigue sometimes and... Uh, you want to push through that fatigue to get yourself to the point where you can stair step down. A typical scenario would be something like that three week on four week or three week on one week off scenario, right? Where you train hard for three weeks. And even if it gets tough at some points, you keep telling yourself you're going to get that one week off. And I personally use more of an organic approach, right? Like I'll look at the calendar. I'll see where I'm going to be traveling uh, and doing intense travel where I wouldn't be able to train as hard. I'll train really hard leading up to that travel and then super compensate and recover when I'm, mm -hmm. you know, when I've got my ass on an airplane for, you know, the next 12 hours and then I'm sitting in a conference room for the day, you know, and I have a lot less of a chance to work out. So you can do it organically, you can do it systematically, but ultimately I wouldn't worry too much, uh, if you're, you know, about your body being 100% ready every single day of the week. Cause that's not really how you increase fitness. Yeah, it's a hard thing for especially new athletes to wrap their head around sometimes is that fitness isn't a linear line. Like it doesn't, you don't just feel stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and then boom, race day happens and you're done. Like it's really a much more of a roller coaster. Yep, exactly. So there you go. Roller coaster, or as we say down here in the U.S., a, a stair-stepping effect. What is the difference between pill amino acids, powder amino acids, and naturally taken in by your body amino acids like um food well i guess the the first thing is that food looks a lot better on instagram and in food porn photos compared to a pile of powder and tablets that's one aspect yes mm -hmm. 
So if you want more likes, go with real food. Yeah. Uh, in terms of recovery benefits, um, you know, d- just backing up here in terms of amino acids, uh, you know, th- there there are eight essential amino acids that your body needs uh, and that uh, your body can't necessarily make itself. And I actually, j- if you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com, you know, I don't have time to get into the whole article, but I just published like a 3,000 plus word article on the difference between essential amino acids and branch chain amino acids and why uh, anybody who's engaged in anything from ketosis to intermittent fasting to looking for increased muscle to being injured and wanting better recovery should definitely have either an essential amino acids tablet or an essential amino acids powder versus just steak or chicken or fish or egg or something like that as a part of their recovery protocol. And even though the whole article, you know, we take a deep dive into, you know, issues with, with branch chain amino acids, which range from uh, hyperglycemia and insulin resistance to a deleterious effect on serotonin levels to a depletion of B vitamins uh, versus essential amino acids, which, which cause far fewer of those effects and, and have a, a lot more benefits. Uh, one of the things we talk about is this idea of amino acid utilization, amino acid utilization. And that's how much of the actual amino acids, as uh, the the phrase implies, are actually available from the source that you're using to get those amino acids as as building blocks for everything from neurotransmitters to muscles. Now, at the very low, low end of the spectrum are indeed branch chain amino acids. Only about 1% of the amino acid content of a BCAA is utilized by your body. So 99% of a branch chain amino acid is just nitrogenous waste. That's why I I am not a big fan. I, I mean, I, I experimented with them for a while. If you go, um, I think it was actually uh, Peter Atia and I were talking about this back in the day when when we were discussing my Ironman training protocol, and he suggested branch chain amino acids for my Ironman training and ketosis, and they helped, but didn't hold a candle to essential amino acids. And part mm-hmm. of that is due to that amino acid utilization issue. Um, yeah, they're less expensive, but they're also a huge, huge amount of them just results in nitrogenous waste that your body has to process and then eliminate. So there's even a little bit of a load on the kidneys. Nitrogenous waste. Nitrogenous waste. That's my new band name. Mm, it's a good, good band name. Yeah. Could yeah. probably start some kind of a, a garbage truck pickup service based on that as well. <laughs> Perhaps. Nitrogenous yeah. waste pickup. Uh, whey and soy proteins. Uh, that is about... 18% or so absorbed when it comes to amino acid utilization. You can get that up a little bit if you take digestive enzymes when you consume your whey powder or your soy powder or any like vegan protein powder, but there's still a pretty crappy amount that's actually utilized by the body compared to some of these other uh, options. Uh, because you see foods like meat and fish and poultry, those do a lot better, almost twice as, as well as protein powder when it comes to amino acid utilization. Those are about 32% absorbed. You still get you know well over 60%, just basically excreted as nitrogenous waste, however. Eggs are pretty high. Eggs are nearly 50% utilization. So if we were looking at nature's perfect protein from a food source with as little waste as possible, an egg would be at the top of the list. It's also a little bit easier to digest for a lot of people compared to meat and poultry and fish even though some people do have uh, allergenic issues to to eggs. Uh, And then if you look at essential amino acids, uh, even though there are almost zero calories in an essential amino acid because all of it gets absorbed and utilized rather than being being utilized as calories, it's actually utilized as a neurotransmitter building block or a muscle building block, uh, 99% of essential amino acids get put to work by the body. So you only get about 1% or less of nitrogenous waste. And not only that, but you get absorption. And this is really important for athletes who are using this during a workout or before a workout within about 15 to 20 minutes. So you get an instant absorption with almost zero loss of the amino acids that you're trying to get. Mm. So food is tastier for sure. Food looks better as food porn. And (laughs) uh, I'll, I'll link in the show notes to my podcast with Dr. Minkoff, where we, we take a deep, deep dive into amino acid utilization but ultimately, um, I, I would use essential amino acids. And you know, full disclosure, you know, my my new company that I just launched. For those of you who didn't didn't hear about that new company, it's called Kion K I O N. Like one of our flagship products for the reasons that I just described, and for the reason that that I personally 
And especially when I'm traveling or I'm fasting or I'm in ketosis, I pop 20 to 30 grams of amino acids per day because of that amino acid utilization with very little calories and very little digestive cost. Um, I use a lot of amino acids and uh, one of our flagship products over there is an amino acid tablet or an amino acid powder. So, uh, so if you want to check those out, just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 375. But ultimately, uh, amino acids don't hold a candle to food. Do I like steak? Do I like chicken? Do I like fish? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I just posted, speaking of food porn, to Instagram last night's dinner. You know what it was, Brock? Uh, no idea. Something delicious. Okay. Prepare to drool. This is what okay. I make when my wife's not around. I, I come up with weird recipes. So I made myself a nice little wild-caught salmon cooked in grass-fed butter uh, with sea salt and black pepper and a fiddlehead fern powder, which is a, this, this amazing little vegetable powder I get from this guy named uh, Dr. Thomas Cowan, fiddlehead fern powder. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll link to my Instagram page for people who want to see this one. Uh, and then I, uh, and I'm, I'm on a big pumpkin kick right now because it's the fall. So almost every night I bake a pumpkin at about 350 degrees for about an hour and a half. And then I take the pumpkin out and I, I salt that with a little bit of avocado or olive oil. I put a little fiddlehead fern powder on that. And I served all of that over a bed of arugula. So salmon mm. with baked pumpkin over arugula with fiddlehead fern powder and sea salt. So I do not just eat tablets for my protein, but <laughs> I do take advantage of better living through science. And um, Caleb, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of, of essential amino acids for sure compared to food when it comes to getting everything you can from an amino acid utilization standpoint. Okay. Well, we've got our next question is another one that came in on Facebook. And unfortunately, Elena didn't go over to SpeakPipe or over to BenGreedFieldFitness.com and leave her question as an audio, which I'm going to reiterate that everybody should do from now on, because otherwise you have to listen to me struggle through reading it. Um, but her question is, I'd really like to delve into understanding the recovery of self-esteem particularly when placing expectation on oneself to perform and train when the body is ready, but the mind throws a load of negatives. As an athlete and part of a team, it was easy to recover quicker as the camaraderie and the sharing of muscle pain seemed to overcome the, the overcome it psychologically. But now with family commitments and in an industry of helping others, it's become mentally draining to recover for her next training session. Mm. Well, Brock, mm -hmm. despite my extreme passion for sports psychology mm -hmm. and the mental side of training, <clears throat> not. I don't remember you having that. Yeah, I'm not that into mm -hmm. the mental game. I mean, I, as a former tennis player, I definitely did a lot of, of studying on the mental game. And I've talked a lot about it before on the podcast. And I'm, I'm okay with speaking to it. But when I saw this question from Elena, it got me thinking about a book that I literally just read. Uh, and it is a fantastic book. It's uh, written by a PhD and a professional triathlete, written by Simon Marshall and Leslie Patterson. And it's called The Brave Athlete, Calm the F*** Down and Rise to the Occasion. Mm. The Brave Athlete. Uh, brand new book, and it gets into this, and Simon is a complete wizard when it comes to this. So I asked Simon uh, if he could give his perspective on... Uh, Elena's question, and he was kind enough to actually reply to Elena. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, and give Elena Simon's response. And uh, this is uh, this is again the guy who wrote the book, The Brave Athlete. So here you go, Elena. Hi, Elena. That's a great question, and it's actually one that I get asked quite a lot. How do I stop negative thoughts from undermining my self confidence? It might be nagging thoughts about not being fit enough or fast enough or lean enough or living up to expectations that you've created in your head that tell you that in order to feel enough, you must meet them. And as you discovered, when you're in a supportive group, uh, people who give you praise and encouragement, it's often easier because you, you get a booster seat for your confidence. You know, it's almost as if you're outsourcing some of your confidence to others. But when you're training alone, things can feel much harder because they are much harder. The negative self-talk often gets a bit louder and more persistent because there's not as much to confront it or contest it when it happens. And when you get physically and emotionally tired, as it sounds like you experience, whether this is from work, from family commitments or whatever, 
your ability to swat away those thoughts gets even harder still. So the question is, what can you do about it? Well, the first thing to realize is that these thoughts aren't actually coming from the real you at all. And when I say real you, I'm talking about the part of your brain that does the thinking, the frontal cortex. No, the thoughts that you're having begin in a primitive emotional center deep in your brain called the limbic system. It's what we call the chimp brain. Others have called this too, call it this too, but it's, it, we call it a chimp because it acts like a young primate. It's this emotional reacting machine that's prone to tantrums. It can be a bully. It can also be soft and cuddly, but it's often the bully in our head. And all of your feelings and emotions originate in the chimp, as well as the fight or flight response. And they're there for a very good reason. We have emotions to try and force us to make a decision. We don't want you to be in danger. Your chimp brain, is first goal is to keep you alive. So that's a pretty noble cause. We thank it for that. But... It doesn't know that it's just sport. It thinks you're entering into a life and death situation every time, or at least a situation that it's really scared of. And when I mean scared of, your chimp brain is terrified by the thought that you might either be shown to be embarrassed, humiliated, or inadequate. So why does your chimp brain hate these possibilities so much? Well, because millions of years ago, being in those environments often did mean death. When we became ostracized from our troop, we had to fend for ourselves, we had to forage for our own food and for safety and so on. And this rarely ended well. But of course, not anymore, right? Modern day living is not, our lives aren't at stake anymore. But try telling your chimp brain that he doesn't care or know any different. He's just going to give you feelings that scream at you to avoid the situation and to do something that's less scary and more comfortable. So when exercise hurts, you just want to stop. When you see other competitors and your first thought is, oh my God, they all look so much faster and stronger and leaner than me. What am I doing? You've actually been tricked by your chimp brain. Your chimp brain has hijacked you to convince you that you need to get the heck away from there as quick as possible. So the first thing to recognize that this is totally normal. We all feel a certain amount of doubt and worry and negativity when we feel threatened, psychologically or physically. But the trick is not to try and arm wrestle the chimp or to try and expunge these feelings and reject them, but actually accept them because they're not actually coming from the real you. So in an exercise I call a chimp purge, I even encourage athletes to listen to the negativity, to say out loud all of the negative things that your chimp is screaming at you, and you don't actually interrupt him when he's doing this. You don't stop until your chimp has exhausted himself. You know he's exhausted uh, uh, when he runs out of negative things to say or starts saying the same thing over and over again. And for most athletes, this can take between, you know, three to, to 10 minutes or so. It's important that you don't stop just after 30 seconds, because otherwise you've just given yourself the world's worst self talk. You do it until your chimp has nothing left to throw at you. You can do this, you know, and what often what I recommend is you do it as you roll up to a race in the car. Before you get out of the car, you say it out loud or you write it down or you say it to yourself at night, the night before that threatening situation or the situation that scares you. And afterwards, you feel a bit lighter, unburdened. And many people report, report feeling like strangely tranquil. And there are some biochemical and 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 neurophysiological reasons why this happens. But suffice to say, it really actually works. So obviously do it when when you won't be distracted or or do it in a quiet place so you don't look like a total lunatic. But it's a really effective strategy, chimp purging. And the second thing I recommend is to start confronting each of the negative thoughts with the powers that only your smart brain, the real you, has. And that's facts and logic. So for each negative thought, ask yourself two questions. First, what evidence is there that this will or actually could come true? And by evidence, I don't mean the stories that you've concocted in your head. I mean real tangible proof that this could come true. And second, if it could come true, so what? What will happen if this does actually play out? So I'll give you an example because I was speaking to an athlete yesterday who's a novice 5K runner. And this is what her chimp brain was telling her. You're going to get pummeled out there. You're not a real athlete. They're the real athletes. You're probably going to come last and people will be looking at you. You're fat stuffed into that lycra and they're thinking, why is she doing this? She's got no business being here. So you can see when you you hear those words, 
they obviously sound a bit silly because they're not the real us. And we know that a lot of these things intuitively are rational, but they still seem, they still feel really powerful in our own heads. So it doesn't matter if that's not what's happening in your head, but it's a good example because it's a really common thought pattern among athletes, especially beginners. So the first thing we need to think about is the likelihood of these things coming true. So as I said to this athlete, have you ever actually been to a 5K before and watched other athletes or spectators? I mean, most people are so absorbed in their own stuff to even notice other people, let alone judging other people. That's simply not what the running community does. And if some of them do do that, then they often get called out or criticized for it. But the reality is that no one actually cares how fast you are or what you look like, except you and your chimp. But let's say, you know, there is a possibility that you'll be near the back or even last. So the next question is, well, so what? So for that, we say, well, listen, guess who gets the most encouragement or the biggest cheer at races? It's not the runners at the pointy end of the race. It's those near the back. So so what that you feel like, you know, a sausage stuffed in lycra casing? We say, well, listen, remember, this is what life in lycra as an athlete is it's all about. It's tight because it's, you know, it's lighter, it's faster, and it's the part of the clothing that makes you an athlete. So the next time you're facing an intimidating situation, I, I'd like you to remember this mantra. The only two things that are always in your control are effort and attitude. Now, this is true whether you're a newbie 5K runner or a professional world champion. Every race is about committing to giving your best and staying positive. Nothing else matters during the race. And it's the only thing that you should judge your performance on. So with that, good luck. So, Elena, there you have it. Straight from the mouth of Simon Marshall, PhD, the author of the Brave Athlete book. So a big shout out to Simon for his help with that question. And for those of you who want to read the book, it actually is really, really good. My favorite part of the whole book was the part where you get to write down your alter ego. And mine was Rocky Balboa. So in my next mm-hmm. Spartan race, I'm going to be, uh, I'm gonna be wearing like the, the gray hoodie and uh, dancing up on stage with my Italian stallion t-shirt. That's my plan. So uh, anyways, though, I'll put a link to the book, bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 375. Uh, you can check out this book, and hopefully that helps you out, Elena. Great question. Okay, which leads us to our final question from Jeff, another written question, and it is a simple one. It's, what are your top five free or least expensive recovery musts? Ooh. Ooh. Fun. I, like I, I dare you to keep it to five. I bet you can. Okay. I could totally keep it at five. Watch me. You think? Number one, free okay. or least expensive. That's not going to shock anybody, but that I'll still cite a good study for. Cold water immersion. Brand new study actually just came out on this, even though there's a lot that came out before it, on cold water immersion that can shut off post-workout inflammation. I remember now, this is what I wanted to say about inflammation. It wasn't about curcumin and stuff. It was about cold. Uh, the results of this one are pretty simple with uh, 11 hard training males getting submitted to 20 minutes of cold water immersion post-workout. Did uh, you cold just say water hard immersion, males? Hard males. <laughs> cold water immersion worked <laughs> on that and much more. Uh, it worked and it did so really well. Um, not only was uh, the swelling vastly controlled with the cold water immersion but we saw a very significant blunt in the normal inflammatory response to resistance training. However, because that can also blunt the natural hormetic response to training, Mm -hmm. my recommendation is that unless you've had a really hard workout close to bedtime and you got to get your core temperature down so that you sleep well, this would be for any workout that occurs closer than three hours to bedtime because a hard workout close to bedtime, if it finishes any closer than three hours, it will disrupt your deep sleep cycles. Uh, aside from that scenario, save your cold shower for earlier in the day or later in the day. Same reason as you should save, like I mentioned earlier, things like curcumin and CBD and other anti-inflammatories for a different time of the day. But ultimately, cold showers, and, and I'll link to this new study on cold water immersion if you want to see what it is. Cold showers, cold immersion, cryotherapy chambers are not free or least expensive, but that'd be another option. That's number one. Got yeah. it? One. Okay. Got it. Number two, uh, even though we see, uh, for example, some studies cited on PubMed that say that 
fasting and lack of fluid and food intake might challenge an athlete's ability to be able to recover optimally. Turns out that there's actually some other really interesting studies that look at improved recovery from both endurance exercise and weight training with a fasting protocol and even caloric restriction. Uh, For example, in one study, they had three weeks of overnight fasted endurance cycling in athletes, and all of them saw improved post-workout recovery. And then there was another study on fasted endurance training that found that it might more quickly reactivate muscle protein translation, uh, meaning an increase in post-workout muscle protein synthesis and muscle recovery by fasting uh, after endurance exercise, or more specifically, I'm sorry, not fasting after, but performing endurance exercise in a fasted state. Hmm. Uh, We also see uh, in weight training, another study that found that subjects who lifted weights in a fasted state have a greater anabolic response, what's called an intramyocellular anabolic response, and they see increased levels of a muscle protein synthesis signaling mechanism called P70 kinase. That's an indicator of muscle growth. Uh, there's a guy named Martin Birkin. Uh, he runs a website called Lean Gains, I think is the name of his website, leangains.com, where he delves into this a lot in terms of fasted training and boosting of muscle growth. Although he recommends, as do I, that to amplify those effects even more, you take drum roll please, amino acids Mm, prior to a fasted uh training session to do that even better. You also see better glycogen repletion and better glycogen retention when you exercise in a fasted state. So I would say some form of fasted training not overdone would actually be a decent uh, way to recover. And on your off days or your easier recovery days, doing something like a calorie cycling approach where you're clearing up inflammation that might result from, from just the normal digestive process would be another recommendation. So not only doing some of your workouts in a fasted state, but also fasting on your easier days can be a good recovery strategy. And the only thing I'd recommend that you do on those fasting protocols is include some of the things that your body does need, like a good multivitamin mineral complex, uh, a good amino acids blend, and uh, potentially like some ketones or some minerals to kind of keep your energy levels up. So big fan of that approach. All right, that's two. That's two. Uh, Next one would be light. So red and near-infrared light. And I actually have light shining on both my back and my front side this whole time that we've been podcasting can be fantastic for repair of damaged tissue. Uh, There are studies that have shown that red and near-infrared light, so both far and near-infrared light, can assist with muscle tissue damage, can assist with collagen production, can assist with uh, mitochondrial density. And one of the reasons for that is because these light therapies help to improve the mitochondrial respiration cycle and help mitochondria produce energy more efficiently. And that means your muscles are going to be less likely to suffer from fatigue. Uh, They also help promote production of antioxidants, which reduces oxidative stress. Uh, They reduce inflammation that leads to cell damage. They increase what's called microcirculation, meaning your tissues are better able to receive oxygen and other nutrients that they need for muscle healing and also get rid of of toxic byproducts. And there's even some really interesting studies that show that light therapy promotes muscle hypertrophy or actual growth of healthy muscle tissue uh, in terms of both muscle thickness and strength. And uh, they've shown those results using ultrasound and what's called dynamometry, which would be a way to to test your actual strength. So it turns out that there's a host of studies that have shown that everything from low-level laser therapy to infrared therapy can assist with muscle recovery uh, via a lot of those mechanisms that I just talked about. And it turns out that big biohack in the sky called the sun actually (laughs) produces near and far infrared rays. And by simply getting outside into the sun, you can take advantage of a lot of those things. Uh, You know, I I use this light. I don't think it's any secret. I use this thing called a juve light uh, for enhancement of testosterone and for collagen production and skin and to stay toasty warm when I'm cold after my morning smoothie. Uh, But ultimately, uh, it turns out that infrared light, whether it's from the sun or whether it's from one of these biohacking type of devices, would be number three. So there you have it. Number three, there you go. Number four, I talked earlier in the show about PEMF and how it can stimulate that process that I referred to called myosin phosphorylation. And a lot of these PEMF devices 
uh, can restore. We didn't say what PAEMF stands for oh. at any point. It may be time to say that. Pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. Uh, right. And that can be used for sleep at different frequencies, like 3 hertz, for focus at 10 hertz, or for muscle repair and recovery at about 100 hertz. There's even some really interesting studies on like depression and anxiety at 1,000 hertz. Well, these same electromagnetic fields produced by some of these devices that can be placed on specific areas of tissue to heal injuries or to enhance muscle repair and recovery can also be had by, drumroll please, going outside and walking Hmm. barefoot on the ground or laying on the ground or even as they do in some especially eastern countries like there's a there's a great story about this in egypt for example that some workers will do this to enhance their muscle recovery at the end of a hard day they bury themselves under the sand like out in the out Hmm. in the desert any of these methods yeah and go to the beach bury yourself in sand but any of these methods actually uh, expose you to the Earth's natural ge- geomagnetic field. It's called earthing or grounding. So you could use one of these fancy PEMF devices, or you could also just uh, walk barefoot on the ground or earth. Uh, there are these uh, PEMF devices called the earth pulse, for example. Like I mentioned, the one on my butt right now is called the flex pulse. A lot of options there. Uh, and then there's even uh, these sandals that I wear when I'm in recovery mode called earth runners that have copper plugs in the bottom of them that allow you to stay in touch with the planet as you're walking or, or running or recovering. So that'll be number four. Now, wait, here's the question for you. Does yeah. that still work if you're on like asphalt or concrete or do you have to be on like grass or dirt or gravel? It's, or it's only going to produce a significant effect if you're on grass or dirt or sand or something like that. But yeah. it's still useful if you're outside and you don't want to go barefoot or you're concerned about sharp rocks or glass or things like that. So, Yeah. Those are called Earth Runners. And by the way, everything I'm talking about, I'll link to over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 375. Uh, And then the last one would be sleep, but not just sleep, but deep sleep, which is where a lot of your repair Mm. and recovery is going to occur during your slow wave sleep. And there are certain strategies that you can use to enhance your slow wave sleep. I mentioned finishing up any hard workouts within three hours before bedtime Uh, or if it's closer than that to bedtime, taking a cold shower afterwards to decrease the body's core temperature because that cooling effect can really enhance the deep sleep cycle. And I've I've tested my own sleep, again, with this ring I mentioned, the, the Aura ring, and that allows me to track deep sleep cycles. And one of the best things I can do for deep sleep is to just have my sleep temperature where it needs to be. Uh, but in addition to that, when it comes to deep sleep, there's a few different uh, botanicals, nutrients that work well. Uh, anything that causes a release of gamma amino butyric acid, I am a fan of. Uh, there is uh, one thing called passion flower extract that you can just get in like a dropper bottle from, say, Amazon that you can take prior to bed for a natural release of GABA. A uh, small glass of alcohol can actually cause a release of GABA, like a little glass of wine, for example. What? Uh, yeah, you, that's a natural source of gamma amino butyric acid. Now, if you overdo it, you wake up a little bit later on once that all wears off. So you don't want to flood yourself with GABA, but a little bit can be pretty helpful. Would you call that a microdose? A microdose of alcohol. Uh, there's a there's uh, another supplement that uh, is called Sleep Remedy uh, made by Dr. Kirk Parsley that has a little bit of a, a really good form of GABA in it that does a good job crossing the blood-brain barrier. It's a very small GABA molecule, pH GABA. Uh, cannabidiol, believe it or not, has been shown to improve deep sleep cycles quite significantly. So that would be another option using like a like a CBD type of supplement. Uh, and then uh, the pulsed electromagnetic field therapies that I talked about earlier, using those in bed at a frequency of about 3 hertz can help quite a bit with deep sleep as well. So that would be another one to, to look into. Um, kava. Kava is actually something that increases deep sleep. I know some of these aren't free, but they're relatively inexpensive, things like kava or, or passion flower. Um, acupuncture or acupressure laying on one of these mats. And I've actually been doing that a little bit before bed. I've been doing a lot of my reading in the sauna these days because it's getting cold in Spokane. And, and in the cool winter, it's nice to go lay in the sauna before bed at night. And then I'll take like a, like a nice walk outside to the hot tub to cool the temperature a little bit, get in, get out, come back inside. But I lay on that acupressure mat in the sauna. Uh, acupuncture and acupressure have been shown to specifically assist with those deep sleep cycles. 
A um, couple other things that I would look into uh, would be uh, pink noise. Not white noise, but pink noise. A lot of these apps, like I have one called Sleepstream, will produce a specific form of noise very similar to white noise, but at a slightly lower frequency. And what they've shown is that that boosts deep sleep even better than some of these white noise, noise blocking apps. And those are typically free or pennies on the dollar to use something like a, like a, a pink noise app. Uh, and then there's even this concept of TDCS or trans direct cranial or current stimulation. Uh, there are devices like the Halo, for example, that and those are marketed to athletes for use prior to hard workouts, but you can also use them uh, before bed to enhance your deep sleep cycles. That would be another example. That's more like $600 compared to free, but it's mm. an option. Yeah. And there are even Definitely websites online that show you how to make it yourself from Radio Shack with a, with a <laughs> battery and some wires. So there's that. Yikes. Um and uh, th- those would be some of the biggies uh, when it comes to sleep. There's a lot more. Obviously, I could go on and on when it comes to deep sleep. But those are some of the first things that come to mind would be like a cannabidiol or a GABA, acupressure, acupuncture, PEMF, uh, Kava, uh, some kind of a sleep stream app. And you'd use pink noise with it. Uh, and then, um, yeah, those would, be, those would be some of the biggies. So there you have it. You cold, did it. cold, sun earthing, deep sleep, and uh, and fasting. So there you have it. Free and easy recovery biohacks. Five. Straight from the Ben Greenfield Fitness Show. Biohacks. Nice work. Yeah. Well, uh, I know we've been going on. We're getting a long in the tooth, so I think it's about time that we, uh, yeah, this is a long that we give something away. What do you think? Absolutely. Let's do it. All right. So here's how this works. If you leave a review on iTunes and you hear your review read on this show, then we will send you a handy-dandy Ben Greenfield Fitness gear pack with a cool tech t-shirt and a water bottle and a beanie or as a toque, as Brock would call it, a compression toque. And Mm -hmm. uh, all you need to do if you hear your review right on the show is you email gear at greenfieldfitnesssystems.com. That's gear at greenfieldfitnesssystems.com, and we'll send you that Handy dandy prize pack. Just be sure to include your t shirt size. So, yeah. today's podcast review left in iTunes, five star review, I especially like because it was left by a master Cornelius. Do you know who mm-hmm. Cornelius was, Brock? Uh, the Planet of the Apes guy? Mm, not in my book. I'll tell you. Mm. I'll tell you. But first, oh, yeah. why don't you go ahead and read the review? Okay, I got to do my best not to get choked up because this is kind of a nice one. Mm. We usually get kind of smart assy ones, but this one's actually really heartfelt. It goes like this. Ben and company are the real deal. Not only is Ben and the show awesome, but so is the team behind him. I want to give a special thanks to your customer support staff, Amber and Alicia. My dad was in his late 80s and getting confused with his orders, and they were ever so helpful. Really, really patient with him. I will be a fan of Ben and the show forever because of them. My dad recently passed away, but I have many memories, many wonderful memories listening to the show with him. He looked forward to it every week. We had lots of good conversation, even if we didn't always get it. Good times. Thank you. Hmm. That's nice. A big shout out to Alicia and Amber, two of our fantastic yeah. uh, customer care reps over at Keon. So that's really awesome. So it turns, it is out awesome. that, turns out we're not p-ing too many people off. That's great. Well, you and I are pissing everybody yeah. off, but Amber and Alicia are doing yeah. a great job of mopping up our mess. They're cleaning up our mess. <laughs> uh, so thank Thanks, you, guys. Cornelius. And and by the way, uh, Cornelius, email gear at greenfieldfitnesssystems.com. And Brock, Cornelius, was yeah. uh, he was one of my favorite characters in Chronicles of Narnia. He was the mentor uh-huh. and the advisor of the young Prince Caspian. Cornelius, he was like half human, half dwarf. And uh, he was like this guy with like this long white beard that taught Prince Caspian everything he knew about sword play and sailing ships and beyond. So this very well could be the same Master Cornelius. And we may have a fan who is half dwarf, half human, with a long gray beard, twinkling eyes, short and fat. Could be him. Or perhaps he's a, a talking ape. Or a talking ape. From the future. As well. Yeah, that's right. He's in Planet of the Apes too, huh? Yep. Who, who knows? But either way, Master Cornelius, thanks for the wonderful review. Amber yeah. and Alicia, if you're listening in, 
Shout out to you, our fantastic, if I can talk, our fantastic, fantastic. customer support staff. And uh, Brock, thank you, man. Thank you for being that Peruvian wonder that you are. I did eat a lot of coca leaves while I was there, so that could explain why I was so damn funny this week. Mm, you were. All right, folks. Well, until next time, <laughs> I'm Ben Greenfield, along with Brock Armstrong. Access all the show notes, all the goodies, everything that we've talked about at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 375, and have an amazing week. Brock? Yes? Goodbye. Bye. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice. Thank you.